So Vamos good morning. We now will continue with the Latin American IPv6 forum. We will now ask our keynote speaker to come, John Jason Trosovsky. And I apologize if I mispronounce it. That's what the speaker said. So John has participated at other events with us. He co-chaired the Visoc ITF group. He has significantly collaborated to the creation of numerous standards that promote the adoption of IPv6. He also co-chaired the HC group of IETF, which is dynamic host configuration. And in fact, he has been one of the promoters of IPv6 adoption for Comcast which is one of the greatest um, providers in the United States and in the rest of the world. So for me, it is an honor to invite John, please. You can use this one, the other one. Uh, Any, anyone? I'll just I'll Thank you. Uh, to, to, to handle the slides, please use this remote. Okay. We go forward. The green one, forward. Buenos dias. This is uh, almost the extent of my Spanish uh, for, for today, so I do apologize. I promise uh, maybe one day for Alejandro and, uh, and the rest of the, the Latin folks here that I will try to one day deliver a presentation fully in Spanish uh, for you, um, so m maybe in a couple years. Um, I first want to thank Alejandro and, and everybody from the organizing committee here at LACNIC. Um, you guys have generously extended an invitation for me to participate in many LACNIC meetings. Uh, I believe this is the third one. Um, I'm, I'm honored and very thankful that you guys um, you know, uh, you know, will, will have us down here from a, from a Comcast point of view. Uh, we really do enjoy and feel it's very important to share uh, a lot of things that, that, that we've learned and, uh, and that we've done from a V6 point of view. Um, and we really do hope you find it valuable. So with that being said, um, I will try to honor the request of the translators and speak as fast as I can. OK? Beautiful. Yeah, they're giving me the thumbs up. They're saying, faster, John. Speak faster. So, um, so what I'd like to do today is um, I'll try not to bore you with things that you may have uh, you may already know, um, and I'll try to kind of make sure that this is, this is as interesting as possible for you. One of the things that I, I discovered uh, as I was making some last minute slide updates, which I'm sure stressed Alejandro out a little bit, is uh, I noticed that um, we are in a hot spot of V6 here in South America. Uh, so it is, it is very nice that we are, um, that, that, that Peru is very green as far as kind of uh, the graph that you see here from a V6 deployment perspective. Uh, I got this from Jeff Houston's uh, APNIC statistics, I believe, um, and um, you know, more importantly, you know, we're we're here in Lima, uh, so I, I thought that was you know very poetic in uh, in some way, shape, or form for us to be here having this conversation about V6 at a LACNIC meeting in uh, in the in the country in South America that is that has a, a significant V6 deployment. So. Before I dive into talking to you about some things that are you know, perhaps Comcast specific, I want to kind of take a step back, reset, and talk a little bit about what's happening big picture around the globe from an IP6 point of view. Um, the internet is changing, my friends, uh, and it's changing at a very, very rapid rate. Um, this is one of the things that I, I put in last minute uh, because it recently hit the news. 
Um, but you're seeing a lot of service providers having extremely pervasive V6 deployments. AT&T, Verizon Wireless, each exceeding 50%. Uh, Comcast, uh, you know, we also have a very pervasive deployment of V6. You'll, you'll hear more about that momentarily. Um, but also worth noting is some, some newcomers. Um, the, the, there's a Saudi Arabian telecommunications company that about four weeks ago, maybe, had almost zero IPv6. And within a month, maybe a little bit more, um, they have had a, a vertical increase in, in uh, the graphical representation of their v6 deployment. You'll also note that many other players are also coming to the plate and deploying v6 support as well. Um, various providers across uh, South America, Brazil, Sprint in the US, Belgium in Europe have just you know, done an extraordinary job accelerating support of v6. Um, really tells you a lot about the current state of where we are. The internet is, in fact, rapidly changing. Uh, you'll notice here that this picture from the Saudi deployment, again, I, I believe I, I borrowed this from Mr. Houston and AP Nick. Uh, I mean, that line does not get any more vertical than that, which is just absolutely amazing. So I think it will be you know, great to see how the companies like Saudi, Saudi Arabia Telecom and others continue to advance their work from a V6 deployment point of view. Big picture, our numbers continue to grow. Um, both AP NIC and Google represent um, the V6 deployment as up and to the right. Um, and I think the message here from my point, um, from my perspective to you is uh, this is happening and it's happening very fast. But what I'd like to do is take a little bit of a step back and tell you a little bit about where this journey began, specifically from Comcast's point of view. Um, some of you may have heard this before, maybe not. Uh, so I'll kind of spare you the history uh, if you've heard it. But our journey began nearly 10 years ago. We, were, we at Comcast were arguably one of the very first uh, and earliest adopters of E6. Um, we started in 2005 or around 2005 where we started to introduce support for IPv6 into, into, into the underlying technologies that we use to run our business on a daily basis. One of the things that I would like to make sure that you guys are, are very clear around today is V6, when we started, and probably the hundreds of talks that I've done over the past 10 years, um, the earliest ones really, you know, um, you know, V6 was kind of, it was a nice to have. It wasn't mandatory from a, a business point of view 10 years ago. Um, that, that environment has changed significantly over the past 10 years. And I want to tell you a little bit um, about how so that, that is the case within Comcast. Today, we manage tens of millions of devices using IPv6 only. There is no v4 support. Uh, over the past three years, you see the graph here, and I don't know if there's a, a laser pointer or not. Maybe there is. Oh, there is. You'll see that back here, the, uh, the vast majority of the devices on our network or IPv4, with a very small number being v6. And again, this is for management only, right? So these are interfaces that are not necessarily used by our customers. They're used by my coworkers and myself to deliver this, the products and services to our customers that, that they want. And you'll notice that in the, in the earliest days, there's, there's um, a, a smaller number of v6 devices. Over time, maybe about a year and a half to two years ago, we crossed a threshold where more than half of our network or the, or the devices were being managed using v6 only. You'll also take note that from this point forward, we, we not only switched every existing device to IPv6 only, but we've also leveraged v6 to account for a significant amount of growth that we could have never achieved using IPv4. Um, and this is only the beginning. And some people would say, uh, a V6 only, you know, using V6 only for device management doesn't sound very sexy. Um, but uh, when it comes to being able to grow your business, to establish a platform for innovation, it is, it, it is sexy, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so 95% of the devices on our network are managed using V6 only. Um, we are one of the largest uh, deployments of V6 in the, in the world. Uh, we expect to get to 
management of our, of our infrastructure, particularly for customer devices, sometime later this year, maybe, uh, maybe early next. Um, the, the point that I'd like to underscore here is that V6, and, and you'll hear about this more and more throughout the rest of this, this presentation, is it is ingrained in the way that we do business at this stage of the game. There is no turning back for us. It is an integral part of how we manage our business and deliver products and services to our customers. So what else about our deployment? So throughout the course of 2014, you'll notice that these are our world IP6 measurement graphs around the enablement of V6 for broadband, right? So, so the first part of the slide that you saw there or on the, the previous slide was our internal use of V6, very extensive, tens of millions of devices. On the flip side of that, we've also have been very aggressively enabling support for broadband and V6. Our deployment model at this time is basically native dual stack. So every customer who has IPv4, we've simply added IPv6. Today, and these graphs that you see here, are, are, are basically how the world has seen our deployment from a broadband point of view for dual stack enablement. And you'll see that our, our growth has been up and to the right. But it is important to note, everybody has, the, every road has rough patches, right? So you'll notice here that we had a little bit of a downturn. We, had, we found some bugs and some stuff that we, uh, uh, various elements in our network that we had to roll back some V6. Uh, probably about 30% of our customers we had to roll back beginning earlier this year. But you'll take note that it did not take us long to recover that, right? And that line will continue to go up and to the right for us. Um, and this is where we are as of, I think this is another late addition that I had to the slides. This is where we stand as of this morning or maybe a couple days ago from a World V6 point of view. Um, you should also note that even though World V6 kind of reports us as having, say, you know, you know, 30 to 35 percent V6 penetration. There's only one. There's only one group that really knows how much V6 is truly deployed. And from Comcast's point of view, and from every operator's point of view, that's the actual operator. So even though the the World V6 launch measurements kind of indicate you know 35-ish percent, um, we know that we've taken V6 to 60 percent of our broadband customer base, um, and we expect that to grow over the next uh, throughout the balance of this year and over the next several years. So let's compare and contrast a little bit about where we were a year ago. About this time last year, 30% of our customers were provisioned with native dual stack. That's doubled. We're now at 60%. Uh, we planned for 50% penetration by the end of the year, and we've, we've clearly exceeded that um, by achieving over 50%, um, and this year is you know, only halfway through. Um, we had about 90% of our broadband network, right? So for those of you who operate a broadband network, you know that your access network infrastructure is different than the actual CPEs that are in your customers' homes. So about this time last year, we had about 90% of our cable access network that was V6 enabled by default. Um, by late April, early May of last year, we had already had completed that to be 100%, um, well ahead of schedule. Um, Approximately 5% of our traffic, th this time last year, was V6. Um, and we planned for a 50% increase. At this stage of the game, this statistic is actually incorrect. We're actually approaching 20% at this stage of the game. Um, so, so you say to yourself, wow, that's m most people that I, I share this information would say, wow, that's, that's amazing, that's impressive. Um, and I guess from my point of view, well, I do think it's, it's, it's good progress. Um, the question you must ask yourself is, is you know, John, if you have 60% of your customers with IPv6, why isn't your traffic also 60%? Why is, why is there a disparity between these two figures? Interesting question. Um, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a little bit more about that here as we kind of dive in. There are a number of variables that control v6, and, it's, and ultimately its usage, which kind of equates to traffic. So from our point of view, we can take V6 to a wide, uh, to, to, you know, to 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 percent of our customer base. But there are, there are two other variables that are very important to mix into this conversation. Where are my customers going on the internet, right? the websites that they visit, and the devices that they're using, right? do they also support IPv6? And what you're going to find is that in many cases, even though broadband providers, as you saw in many of the earlier slides, are really aggressively advancing their deployments of V6, we still have to make sure that from an ecosystem point of view, 
that we are that we're kind of making sure that we have a complete V6 uh, experience. So today, and some of the things that we're we're measuring, right, and and we talk about these at, at the various meetings that you know um, that some of the folks I see here, I, I see them regularly, you know, multiple times per year. We're looking at what percentage of content on the internet is available with V6 support by default. And we're also working very closely with the consumer electronics organizations, you know, saying, hey, wait a minute, um, my Mac, my telephone, my tablet, these all support IP6 by default. However, what about your smart television, which is now an active consumer of the, you know, of internet connectivity today, right? I can assure you that the vast majority of these do not support IP6. One of the things that you'll notice here at the very bottom of the slide is the fact that we, um, you know, and I think I also borrowed this from, you know, the Internet Society and the World IP6 launch page. You'll notice that the number, the percentage of the Alexa Top 1000 that is enabled with V6 by default is only about 15%. Uh, the good news there is probably two months ago that was 13%. And you know, concerningly, it was it was fluctuating, and it was fluctuating downwards, which was not what we want to see. So, what, so, so the two main points that I'm trying to emphasize here on this slide in particular is it's not just about broadband, okay? It's about the entire ecosystem. Content must be enabled by default with V6 support. And your consumer electronics, the things that you're consuming that content with, must too be enabled with V6 by default. Um, if there's interest for the, for the consumer electronics piece, I'm happy to talk to anybody after the fact, but there's a there's a there's a separate set of activities that I am I am kind of participating in that really are trying to catapult the nature of V6 support in consumer electronics. So, are we done yet? We're not even close. Uh, depending on where you are and kind of the nature of your deployment, technically we're really just getting started, right? So we've you know, many, you know those of us who have kind of been actively deploying V6. We're to a point now where V6 is foundationally pervasive enough for us to act as a, as a platform for innovation, for the things that come next. Uh, so some of the things that we're talking about um, from a Comcast point of view, right? Not just making the management interfaces internally V6 only, not just enabling dual stack broadband, but we're making all of our products support V6. And in many cases, V6 only. Voice and video are two great examples, but it's more than that, right? Those are fairly obvious um, next steps or opportunities for IPv6. We're getting to the point now where we're doing more with IPv6 than we are with v4. So, you know, we are starting to ask ourselves the question: um, Why do we need v4? Why why can't we consider the possibility of actually turning off IPv4 in various parts of our network, the core of our network? We're talking about the delivery of IPv4 over a V6 transport. We're talking about V6 segment routing. I see Alvaro out there in the audience. And um, you know, we, you know, we're, uh, these are things that we are exploring. We could not explore these, these items without having pervasive support for IPv6 where it acts as a foundation for innovation, right? We're also talking about kind of innovations on the, on, on the on the, on the fronts of, uh, for content delivery, where V6 becomes an integral part around how we deliver content to people, and we do it better than we've been doing it uh, from a V4 point of view. So we can finally get started. Uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole kind of new kind of era of work that we can kind of rush in here um, that all depends on the availability of V6. And the goal, the overarching goal here, is for us to simplify, right, uh, as we kind of look at the way our networks are from a V4 point of view, uh, we see a lot of complexity, right? And as, as V4 continues to deplete, um, I fear, and I think as many do, that V4 will only become that much more complicated. So I'll kind of touch a little bit on some of the things that we're doing internally um, and uh, see if uh, you know, this kind of yields any, any interesting conversation later. But from a Comcast point of view, one of the things that we're looking to do is we're looking to take our very popular um, next generation operating an entertainment operating system called X1, and we're making it IPv6 only. Um, if you look at uh, the the kind of the some of the slides that you saw earlier about the, the rate in which we've been growing, uh, Comcast's the the one chart where you saw the, you know a lot more V6 than there were V4 to begin with. A lot of that comes in the form of our X1 platform. X1 has always been destined to be something that will that will support V6 and V6 only, no V4 support. Um, and 
And, and one of the main reasons is it's very simple. V4 is not sufficient. It's not large enough to support a, a, a product like this that has gotten to become so popular. So we, we knew that V6 was going to be, in, in, in very short order, a part of X1's future. Um, not only are we introducing support for IP6, but it's going to be V6 only. And at this stage of the game, X1 is an interesting system in that it is a system that is, you know, there's, there's a number of closed components to it that are very much internal that we can control very, very, very specifically. But X1 also has elements to it that go to the internet. So from our point of view, um, as we go through many of the same acrobatics that we've done over the past 10 years, uh, enabling servers and VLANs and virtual machines and routers and firewalls, right? We're also doing a lot of interesting work to enable V6 support on the actual set-top boxes themselves. We're also working very closely with our partners in this space, you know, people who build applications for us, people who, build con who, who, deliver, who develop content for us as well. And we're making V6 a, a, a requirement. If, so, so basically what it, what it boils down to is, is if somebody wants to deliver something to the X1, it must support V6, right? Because in, not, in the not too distant future, this device, this product, this service will only be a V6 only service. Um, it's also important to note that, you know, of the millions of X1 devices that we have on our network today, we're not only going to introduce support for new devices for V6, but we're going to go back and migrate all existing devices to become IPv6 only, right? Again, we're talking in the millions of, of devices and customers here. Um, and we've spent a lot of time to, to developing the technology that's going to allow us to seamlessly migrate from V4 to V6 so that this is, you know, like, like we've always said in venues like this, um, it cannot be impactful to the customer. If the customer knows that, they've, that, that their device has migrated from V4 to V6, then we've done something wrong, right? We have the ability to make it seamless to the customer. So what else? Is there life after V4, right? So with X1, I tell you about how we're going to leverage V6 to enhance the platform, uh, deliver, to, you know, deliver better products and services, migrate that from V4 to V6. But what else is there, right? You know, as, as, you know, as I look around, I see you know, many LACNIC folks here and, and folks from other registries around the globe. Um, V4 is coming to an end, right? And, and particularly you know, for me, as somebody who, who uh, does business in the Aaron region, um, we, we expect that this will happen anytime now from a, from, a, from a North American point of view. So is there life after V4? Uh, the answer absolutely is you bet. Um, you know, years ago, uh, there, was, there was a lot of push to really try to get and make V4 something that could be delivered over a V6 transport. Uh, some would say that those ideas uh, and some of the technologies that, that were developed during that time were a little bit ahead of schedule, right? But at this stage of the game, if you, if you think back to the, to the slide where I kind of gave you a big picture around where all these broadband providers are from their V6 deployments and how pervasive they are, one could say, it, it, looks like, it looks like now we're finally ready to go, to go ahead and do that. Um, so what does this mean? It, it, it means that connections to, broadband connections to homes are now possible to be V6 only. No V4 on the WAN interface of these devices. And leveraging that reliable, robust V6 connectivity to that home as a transport for IPv4. So native IPv6 continues to behave as, as it has and, and it does right now, right? But now we're in a phase where V6, again, is this platform for innovation where we can go ahead and now really start to consider its use as, uh, you know, for, for other things like V4 as a service. Um, some of the things that you may or may not be familiar with, right, so back in the day, you know, people, people would um, talk about a number of different technologies that were born um, in a lot of the ITF working groups. But some of the things that we're looking at today, you know, MAP, GRE over IPv6, uh, Lispish type approaches that we can really kind of sink our teeth into to make it so that we could deliver a service, V4 as a service, using a V6 transport. Take your pick. And, and, and truthfully, I don't think it's fair to say that one size fits all here. Every operator, every, every use case, every deployment scenario has a different set of conditions, right? And it's probably not the right thing to do to try to force one um, on everybody, right? Um, nor, should, you know, nor is it our place. Um, so what we are talking about is, is essentially, you know, either tunneling and or encapsulating IPv4 for, for, for you know, customer side access to, to the Internet. Um, one of the things that you'll, that you'll note is that um, 
you know, you, or you might have questions around is, is what does this really mean from a V4 point of view, right? Uh, so we'll talk about that in a second. So um, what else? What, what else does, this, uh, does, does the pervasive support for V6 really allow for us to do? So, you know, not to sound like a marketing person, not to sound cliche, right? But um, at this stage of the game, um, our, all of our infrastructures are, are transforming in front of our very eyes, right? Um, virtualization, cloud computing, SDN, they're all acronyms that I'm sure we hear and we, we're inundated with on a, on a, on a regular basis. Um, Comcast uh, is no different. We're also inundated with those as well. But one of the things that we are doing is, is we're actually trying to sink our teeth into and, and really do what we've done from a NFV SDN point of view. We're trying to kind of you know, recreate what we've done from a V6 perspective, right? So with V6, we, we really do believe that we've put our money where our mouth is, right? We've really shown, um, you know, you know, the internet community that we were serious about V6, um, and I think that shows, and now what we're trying to do very similar things when it comes to um, NFV and SDN. Um, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on from a Comcast point of view is we, we kind of are, are heavy uh, adopters of OpenStack, and we're starting to dabble, our, dabble in and put our, our kind of... Um, you know, get involved with other kind of open projects as well. ODL happens to be one that you may have seen in the news recently. One of the things that Comcast had done, uh, so the intersection of NFV or cloud and V6 is, you know, we had implemented V6 support in our own internal OpenStack clusters, turned around, made those patches available uh, as, I, I believe, one of the first kind of deployable patches for OpenStack and V6. When we first set, when I, when I first sat down with the OpenStack team internally within Comcast, and we, we looked at implementing support for IP6, um, there, there was no way it could be done. So we, we basically had to go back and you know, develop some patches, contribute those back into the OpenStack community, which ultimately led to, I think, some of the earliest support, you know, production support for IP6 and OpenStack. Uh, turns out that the X1 program that you heard about on the slide or two before this happens to rely heavily on IP6 and OpenStack, which is the reason why we went ahead and did this work anyway. And the OpenStack community continues to have a great deal of activity. As a matter of fact, there's an OpenStack Summit this week in Vancouver. And I know that, you know, in keeping in touch with some people who are out there from a Comcast point of view and from an industry point of view, there's a lot of work that's happening in OpenStack right now from a V6 point of view. Um, and from our point of view, um, we think that there's a lot more than that. The, the, the initial work for OpenStack and V6 was really just to make it so that we had instances that were V6 enabled. Uh, at this stage of the game, um, having this platform, this cloud platform that really supports, properly supports IP6 or will support V6 is instrumental to other initiatives like our V4 as a service initiative. If we wish to virtualize, for example, a map EBR, right, we need a cloud infrastructure that can support it. And that is not necessarily true today, right? Uh, and there's some work that's happening on that front to make it so that we can go, go ahead and do that. We're talking about V6 only data centers. But at the same time, you say to yourself, well, John, is it, is it practical to have a V6 only data center when you still have V4 needs in the network? And we're exploring possibilities on this front to make it so that um, a V6 only data center can still have a V4 identity, at least temporarily, so that we have a seamless way to transition from where we are today to a V6 only state tomorrow. So what's next? Um, more of what's next. So there's a, there's a slew of OpenStack enhancements uh, you know, we've developed an internal roadmap uh, that kind of outlines some of the things that we would like to see OpenStack do from a, from a V6 point of view, everything from where we are today, being able to dual stack instances, to making instances V6 only, um, pr uh, production ready segment routing across the Comcast network, um, you know, virtualized NFV type elements in the cloud, um, and of course, things that are, that, are, that are often overlooked, controller type elements in the network that are going to be critically important to how we run our networks. And then finally, you know, uh, V4 as a service. Um, and, and a number of things that you've, that you've heard me kind of mention already. So in closing, and I think Alejandro, I'm doing okay on time? Okay? So far, so good. So in closing, what, what I like to, what, you know, in preparing for, for this talk today, uh, I really want to kind of find a way to leave you with a handful of key points that I think, you know, will, will hopefully will be useful to you. So why, why V6? 
So those of you who've been doing this for a long time, you know, and, and I see many familiar faces, you know, back in the day, V6 was really originally about more IP addresses. It's, it's truly not the case at this stage of the game. Yeah, it, it, it's, still, it's still a property of V6 that matters to us. It, it produces more V6 addresses. Um, but, but I think we're past that now, right? I think we're, we're at a point now where V6, um, we, we know that is an attribute of V6 that, uh, that is important to us, but that's not the main selling point at this stage of the game, right? Um, it is important to note that there are many findings. Um, Comcast was one of the first that came out, you know, three years ago, and we, and we, and we kind of mentioned to people, hey, we're seeing IPv6 perform better than IPv4. Um, you hear other operators saying the very same thing. Facebook, Facebook uh, has, uh, they did a talk earlier this year um, in Paris, um, and they, and they, and they kind of cited anywhere from 20 to 30 to 40 percent increase in performance for V6 for their users. Paul, uh, Paul Saab, who's a good friend of mine from Facebook, you know, he asked a question to, to people who don't deploy V6. He asked, why do you hate your users? Um, and it's, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, I don't know, um, I don't know if I would say that, but, but, uh, but it is, I, I kind of agree with him that um, you know, V6 has so many benefits. Why, why aren't we, why, why isn't it becoming more pervasive? Um, and truthfully, V6 is simpler operationally, right? I cannot begin to tell you how many times on a regular basis throughout all my interactions with my coworkers that people tell me, hey, John, it is so much easier to put one IPv6 prefix on a CMTS or a VLAN instead of having to supernet 12 IPv4 subnets, right? There's so many aspects of v6 that are just that much more simpler. And really, folks, it is, it is really not that hard to deploy. And finally, um, it is your platform for innovation. Um, it's really what, what uh, we believe, you know, the future of the network is built upon today, right? Whether it's you know, the underlying network or your virtual network um, or all the things that run in it. Um, it is a platform for innovation and we certainly view it as such. So with that, Alejandro, I think uh, I am pretty good on time. Hola. Um, alguna pregunta para el señor John? Any questions for John Jason? Please mention your name and organization. Paris. I work with the Argentina Internet Association. My day job, <laughs> I'm actually in marketing, so if I ask stupid questions from a technical point of view, please be, be patient. Uh, but I do have to assemble internet exchanges, in other words, coordinate their implementation. In Argentina, we have 14 right now. And uh, there is a big concern, I think it's actually embarrassing, the, the low deployment we have with IPv6, and we are set now with a project to correct that. We're going out to do technical assistance and, and hand-holding to about 200 uh, uh, small and medium companies, ISPs and cooperatives, to make sure that they, that they get IPv6 deployed. Otherwise, it will never happen. Uh, my questions are simple. This was just to introduce myself. I have two. Uh, have you... I missed the beginning of your presentation, but have you any consideration about Internet of Things? Has this um, surfaced in your, in your deployment? Is it important? And I'll, I'll ask the second question afterwards. Uh, Tony, thank you for your question. So absolutely, the Internet of Things um, comes up on, uh, on, a, on a regular basis <clears throat> from our point of view. Um, I'm involved with a number of activities from an Internet of Things perspective, <clears throat> and a lot of people um, speak about the Internet of Things um, with a, an absent reference to IP. They say connected, and they say, you know, these things all must connect to the Internet, but they, they kind of hand wave over kind of what IP version. And one of the things that we're doing uh, from an industry point of view, um, not only, you know, my, myself, but also, you know, Comcast, is we're, we're helping people to understand that IPv4 is not um, going to be able to be able to withstand kind of the next wave of, of things that are that are going to kind of cause this burst in number of connected devices. I mean, I think we're on a we're in a we're in a valley right now, waiting for the peak, for the next wave of Internet of Things type devices. And I think from our point of view, uh, we view the availability of V6 
to 60% of our customers as, as exactly the platform that those devices need to flourish and for that space to really kind of continue to grow it, you know, along the trajectory that has grown so far. If you look back just a few short years ago, you know, um, you know, when I started Comcast, for example, there was, there was no more than a couple of devices that was connecting to each one of our customers' homes. Now, 30, 40, 50, and we're talking about tablets and computers and TVs. And these aren't necessarily things that I would call Internet of Things type devices today. So, so in short, Tony, I'd say there's, there's a direct relationship, in my opinion, between V6 and the Internet of Things. You know, V6 is ultimately, you know, going back to the comment I made about being a platform for innovation, it is a fundamental requirement for that space to really kind of, you know, continue to grow. And the other thing is very briefly, I, there's somebody else waiting. Uh, you did mention that uh, content had to be enabled. I, I'm not too sure, because uh, in my concept and what we want to do in Argentina, we're going after access equipment and CPEs. But uh, content, how, how do you enable content? Uh, Content's probably one of the one of the easiest things to enable for V6, Tony. And, and, and the reason I say it, there's really three key variables for V6, right? So if, you're, if you're, you know constituents, your, your customers in Argentina, right, um, push V6 out from a broadband point of view. But the devices that are going to the internet and the destinations that they're going don't, don't use V6, um, V6 will ambiently be available, okay. but not, it'll be unused, right? Okay. Um, the, the key here is to deploy it but also use it. Turning it on doesn't necessarily mean that it's getting used, right? Okay. And that's one of the things that we learned very early on in our deployment five or more years ago is that we can take V6 to our customers from a broadband point of view, but if the websites that they go to aren't enabled and the devices that they're using don't support V6, V6 is, it, it largely sits there quietly unused behind the scenes, which is not, not the goal for us in any way, shape, or form. So it, there's, there's three very key pieces. Happy to talk to you about it kind of after, afterwards, but okay. you know, the, the, the story and the work all have to kind of account for those three items. Thank you so much. Surely. Thank you, John, for your presentation. My question. Name, please. You're right, Alejandro. My, <laughs> my name is Carlos Martinez. I'm uh, with LACNIC. Uh, if, if, you had, if you had to pick one or two things, someone willing to deploy IPv6 on uh, ISP network should be aware of, what would you say? Hmm. Um, I think there's two things that I would point out from my, from my experience. And, and by the way, Carlos is the reason, well, part of the reason why I'm here. So thank you, Carlos, for, uh, for approaching me in Dallas. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, we, we would have not started the conversation. Um, but uh, two things, for, for especially for, for operators, for, for, for operators who, to, uh, who provide connectivity to a large population of people. Uh, first thing is, is our networks are not, um, they're not, they're not typical in the sense that we don't have a, a VLAN uh, of 20, 20 servers or 200 servers. We have aggregation devices that serve tens of thousands of people. The scale, that scale is something to not be taken lightly, right? And it takes smart people like everybody in this room to make sure that when you deploy V6 in environments like that, you do it well, right? Because after the day is done, when you deploy V6, the goal must be to make the, the experience for the customer better than what it was before, right? Taking a step backwards is simply not an option, okay? Uh, and I think the other thing to take note of is um, uh, for, for those of us, again, who, who deploy our own equipment, right, to customers, um, we should take nothing for granted, right? Um, you know, everything should, should, should very much be tested. You know, I, I go through this a lot on a daily basis. I probably spend, this is one of those, one area where I've spent a lot of time over the years is making sure that the customer premise equipment that we develop support for V6 in um, requires a great, a, a good deal of attention and expertise, right? So I, I would, I would encourage people not to just make. I would encourage them not to make assumptions. I would encourage them to kind of take a very active role in in verifying that V6 functionality works the way it was designed to work. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Monica, but the question is not mine. Uh, we have a question from one of our remote participants. Um, Asael from Mexico want to ask you uh, what percentage of the cable modem 
that you tested before deployment, did it uh, have a good IPv6 support? And you, dis you discarded them? Yep. Um, I, I'll, I won't necessarily list all the makes and models, um, Monica, right? Um, but the, the um, interestingly enough, one of the things that I had done very early in our program at Comcast was to assess the V6 capabilities of every DOCSIS device on the Comcast network. So in a, at a very early date, I actually knew over the next five years what percentage of these devices would become IV6 capable. And I think, Monica, it is important to note that the V6 functionality that I introduced into the, doc, the devices on the Comcast network was all done mainly through software upgrades. They were not wholly, a, a hardware upgrade was not required for me to get V6 support for the vast majority of the devices on my network. So I didn't have to call Kevin up and say, Kevin, I'm going to switch your cable modem. I was able to remotely push a software update, turn on support for IPv6, and do it in a way that was seamless. Um, the number that you saw here for me, uh, I said 95% of my cable modems are v6 capable today from a management point of view, right? When I first did the analysis, it was initially like 80%. Um, over the past two or three years, Right, which, which I think you would agree is a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's an impressive number. It's a, it's a very positive number, 80%, yeah? Um, over the past couple of years, we've had a very aggressive deployment of f refresh equipment that I, I helped to make sure was V6 capable from, from the very first day. And that really took us to almost 100%, right? But, but truthfully, in the very early days, we knew that, you know, 75 to 80% of our existing deployed base could be upgraded from a software point of view, to support IP6. Otra pregunta. Good morning. My name is Pablo Kelis. I work for a save, cable service operator in the Dominican Republic. You explained that you started deploying IPv6 on your cable modem management network, and you got to 100%. Uh, however, Surely, the traffic from the clients is dual stack. I mean, they are using mostly IPv4 for many applications. My question is, how high has been the load on your network devices, especially on the HFC network? I'm talking about CMTSs. The load from what point of view? Is it traffic volumes? Uh, load on processor, for example, memory, processor and memory. Um, V4, V6 has not introduced anything out of the ordinary from a memory or a CPU point of view on our, on our CMTSs and our access network. To be perfectly honest with you, we generate internally more CPU utilization because we query the, the CMTSs using SNMP excessively. So, in, so for, 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 for matters unrelated to IPv6, our own internal monitoring systems generate more load than V6 does. V6 is basically, with, with the exception of a handful of you know, bugs or anomalies, um, it's been, there's parity. We don't, we don't see any difference between IPv4 or V6 from a, from a load point of view for CPU and memory. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I wrote down many, many qu different questions, but I am only going to, to make you one question just because of the time. Mm -hmm. My question is regarding your help desk, your network operations center. Uh, what kind of training did you give to them? And additionally, after your IPv6 implementation, which I know that you did gradually, did the calls to the network operations center increase in somehow, or maybe go down? So Alejandro, I'll ask, answer your second question first. Um, generally speaking, when we rolled out IPv6, um, in particularly around world IPv6 launch, there was no change in call center volume, right? Um, no more or, or less than what we see on, as part of normal business, uh, business as usual. Um, from a training point of view, we, we actually, you know, for, for a network like ours that really spans 
you know, co almost coast to coast, you know, the United States. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, making training material available, you know, because we, the, the heart and soul of our company are the folks who really kind of work in the local areas, uh, you know, that, um, that kind of service the customer mo more closely, you know, than, than some, you know, more closely, right? So, so for example, if, uh, you know, we have customers in, in the San Francisco area, for example, or the Philadelphia area, there are, there are my coworkers who are based in that area that, that, are, that are kind of directly responsible for interacting with the customers themselves. Now, for someone like myself, who comes from like kind of the headquarters or the national, um, the national organization, I, I interact directly with a lot of our customers, probably more so than most people um, who have a job like mine do, right? Because I, I believe it's, it's, an important, it's, it's an important aspect to making sure that uh, you know, to make sure that we deliver technology, or we deliver, you know, we, we deploy new technologies without affecting our customers, right? Those of us who lead those efforts must know what the customer is experiencing. So we did a lot of things, Alejandro. We, um, we, had, we had hired some consultants at, at one point. Uh, we, so internally, we developed the material, okay? Um, because we, we felt like that was something that, that we needed to do because we have subject matter expertise. But it's, and we also had a handful of key employees, myself on some occasions, where we traveled around kind of the various kind of offices in the country, and we delivered training to our coworkers. Um, we also made those training materials available online, uh, internally, through our, our kind of internet, uh, our internal portals. Um, you know, we've done everything from, you know, WebEx to making it available for people to download, you name it, um, we, we made a lot of these things available to, we, we, we employed a lot of different approaches to training our, our, uh, our folks internally. Um, there was a question I was gonna, there was a comment I was gonna make, but I forget what it was now, so back to you. Regarding the, the rate of calls to your network operations center from, from your customers, mm -hmm. did the calls increase or no. decrease in somehow? No, no they, they, they never increased. They, okay. they kept? Or they, they were no, there's no different no difference. before and after IPv6. Yeah. Okay, that is a very typical question that some people yeah. makes before implementing IPv6. Well, I want to, to thank you because I know that you spoke slow. <laughs> he many times speaks quite fast, so okay. thank you so much for that, for that and for your perfect timing. Yeah. Y bueno, habiendo dicho eso, un fuerte aplauso a John. Por su a big round of applause for John. Translators for the speed. Okay, super. <laughs> okay. All right. Y a veces uno olvida a, a las personas que realizan la traducción a. Sometimes we forget the people who translate into Spanish or English or Portuguese. So I would also ask everyone to give an applause. <laughs>